you know, as we were um, getting ready for Taco Weekend, I pray and pray about, God, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to talk about? And the thing that God laid on my heart to talk about was that, that we are called to make our life count. That our lives aren't meant just to be here and then to be gone, but our, our lives are made to count. God wants our lives to count. And I think most people live life and they go through life. And, and in the end, their life may count, but it, uh, it's not as much as God had planned for them. Anybody out there? God wants our lives to make a difference. And, and some people are like, well, I don't, I'm not called to be this, or I'm not going to be a pastor. I'm not going to be that. doesn't matter what you are called to be. You are called to make a difference. And you're called to have your life count. You know, for me... This whole making my life count was one of the reasons why I actually started following Christ. You know, some people give their life to Christ because they're afraid of going to hell. They don't want to go to hell. Anybody out there? And I'm not really interested in going to hell. Anybody with me? I, I don't want to go there. You know, it doesn't sound like a fun place. The Bible talks about it's burning and weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not fun at all. But that wasn't the thing that spurred me to follow Jesus. I didn't want to go to hell, but that wasn't the thing that moved me forward. And, and, and I went to church every once in a while, but I really didn't hear a message that ever spurred me forward. And I thought, well, what's going to make me happy? I wanted my life to be happy. And so I tried to get things I didn't have in order for my life to be happy. I grew up in, in a small town raised by a single mom who didn't have much money. She worked in a factory. And so we were barely able to pay our bills growing up. As a matter of fact, there were many days, actually many weeks, much of my life, where what we ate for dinner was three or four nights a week, we would eat beans. Anybody ever ate beans three or four nights a week? That, okay, first of all, after you eat beans for a little while, you get tired of beans. The second thing with beans is there's an after effect of beans. And so I not only had to eat beans three or four nights a week, I had a brother that I shared a room. I had a brother that I shared a bed with. And so I had a big brother that I shared a room and I shared a bed with after we ate beans four nights a week and we would go to bed and he was much older and bigger than I was. And so when the after effect would hit him, here's what he would do. He would have the after effect of the beans. If you don't know what that is, that's gas. And the room would stink and then he would take the covers and he would pull them over my head and he would hold them there and try to kill me. So I hated beans. My wife one time said, can we have beans for dinner? I said, we never having beans for dinner. Never. Not going to happen. I have bad memories of beans. My kids are already gassy enough without the beans. And, and, and so I thought, man, if I could just have money and have stuff, then I would have joy or have purpose in my life. And one of the things that I wanted was I wanted jeans. I wanted new jeans. Okay, now having jeans with holes in them is cool. But back then it wasn't cool. It was like, and, and my mom couldn't afford the nice jeans, and so she brought me Wranglers. The problem with that was only the cowboys in town wore Wranglers, and I wasn't a cowboy, and I wanted Levi's, Levi 501s, and my mom couldn't afford those. And, and so I got a job, and I worked, and I worked, and I worked, and I bought some Levi 501s. And I remember after I, I bought them, I thought, I'll go to school, and everybody will notice. Nobody noticed. Nobody cared. What I thought was going to give me joy didn't give me any joy. It just spent all my money. And, and so I was like, well, I, I, you know what? Maybe if I have a nicer car, then it'll be better. And I'd always had an old, old pickup truck. I mean, it was really old, so old that the, the floor was rotting, you know. And, and so it was, it was actually kind of convenient sometimes because there was actually a hole in the, in, the, in the truck where if I was just driving around and I had a drink I wanted to pour out, I didn't have to pour it out the window. I just poured it down in the bottom. I literally did that several times. I just poured it down there, and it was very convenient. But I was like, I need a new car. And so I finally saved money and bought a, a, a sports car. Actually, it wasn't much of a sport. It's like a Ford Escort. But it was like... Don't be hating. It was two doors. I only had two doors. So it was like a sports car. And it had those little fin things in the back. And I'm like, this is awesome. I'm looking cool in this Ford Escort. And I bought the Escort. And I, and I recognized that I, I was like, yeah, this is awesome. My life is so much better. That lasted about two weeks until one of my friends got a nicer car than my Ford Escort. And everybody wanted to hang. See, here's the thing. We, we try to search for things. We try to search for things that, that will make our life full. We try to search for them to make our life full, but, but the things we search for often leave us more empty. And I was like, well, I'm trying to fill, I'm trying to fill, I'm trying to fill my life with these things. I thought, well, if I just have that girl, and I would chase that girl, and when I called her, I was like, oh, I don't really want her. And then I was like, well, that would, and I would, I would try to fill my heart with things that always left my heart empty. And then I, I remember I started hearing about Jesus and talking about how he had a plan and a purpose for my life. And I was like, well, I, I need something because I'm always feeling empty. And, and I gave my life to Christ, and all of a sudden I had, this, I had something bigger than me living in me. 
And it wasn't, I want everybody to grab this, okay? Uh, it's not just about going to church because that really doesn't impress God. Anybody out there? Because if you just go to church and you sit in a chair, but you're not living it in here, it doesn't impress him at all. And so, and so I was like, I, I, I want more than that. And I just gave my life to Christ and followed him with all my heart. And I, and I, I got this purpose. I want to read these verses to you that really have purpose and, and make our life count come alive. It's in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. This is in the message translation. It says, we pray, we pray that you may live well for the master, making him proud of you as you work hard in his orchard. Now I'm going to pause that. How, how, how much of the time do we work on our own, doing our own stuff, getting our own way? And the Bible says, no, if you want to have this purpose-driven life, this life that has a purpose, it's not about what you want. It's, it's working in his orchard, doing his purpose and his plan. It says, as you learn more and more how God works, you will learn how to do your work. We pray that you'll have the strength to stick it out over the long haul, not the grim strength of gritting your teeth, but the glory strength God gives, it's, it's strength that endures the unendurable. Who's ever felt like you can't do it anymore? But it's strength that endures the unendurable and spills over into joy. Thanking the Father who makes us strong enough to take part in everything bright and beautiful that he has for us. God has rescued us from dead-end alleys and dark dungeons. And he has set us in the kingdom of his Son, the kingdom of his Son whom he loves. The son who got us out of the pit we were in and got rid of the sins that we were doomed to keep repeating. Here's the deal. This shows a, a life full of purpose. A life where we're not just going through the motions, but a life where we are living on purpose. That we are living a life that truly makes a difference. Who wants their life to make a difference? Then if we live this out, it changes us. As I was studying this, I, I started looking at the life of David. David was an amazing, one of my favorite people in the Bible is David. And so David was a king in Israel. He was a king, and, but he didn't just start off as a king. He started off as a shepherd, as someone no one saw in the wilderness. And what, what God did was God did something. I started studying his life because I thought he had a purpose, but it started where no one saw it. And as I started studying it, I started finding this, this really awesome direction. If we want to have a purpose and we want to have our lives count, he shows us a clear path on how to do that. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. When I looked at the life of David, the first thing I saw in David was, was preparation. Preparation. God took David to this place of preparing him for where he was going to go. He didn't just put him there immediately, but he prepared him to where he was supposed to go. Go ahead. In this story we're going to look at in 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, the, the armies of Israel were being attacked by the Philistines. As a matter of fact, they were, they were like one on one side, one on the other. And the Philistines had this guy, this huge giant named Goliath, who was making fun of God's army and making fun of God's people. And none of the army of Israel wanted to fight him. They were all afraid. Even their greatest warriors were all afraid. And then the shepherd boy walks up. The shepherd boy walks up, and here's, he says, hey, I'll fight the guy. And here's what the king says. King Saul, Saul said, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy. And he's been a fighting man since his youth. And David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. Who thinks that's crazy? Okay, nobody thinks that's crazy. How many of you would chase after a lion? A lion comes and steals a sheep. You're like, oh, I'm going to go get that sheep back. No, I'm not going to get that sheep back unless I have a gun on me. David didn't have a gun. And he goes, okay, he says, I'm going to chase it down. And he, and he says, and after I, I, I went after it and I struck it and I rescued the sheep from its mouth. And after I rescued the sheep from its mouth, it turned on me and I seized it by its hair. Once again, crazy. And I struck it and I killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be one of like them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. And the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, what? Will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine, David said, Saul said to David. And he goes, David, Saul said to him, said, go, the Lord be with you. David said, you know what? I've been through the preparation time. Right. See, if he just shown up and said, I'll fight it, it wouldn't have happened, but what happened? When no one was watching, when no one saw what was going on, God was doing a work in David. How many times do we're like, God, use me to do something big. God, use me to do something big. And God's like, why don't you start 
where you're at. See, we want people to recognize when we do something. But you know what? The preparedness that God wants in us, usually no one ever sees except him. If you want your life to make a difference, your life will make a difference starting when no one is watching. What God wants to do in you and through you doesn't start when everyone sees it. It doesn't start by your post on social media. It starts in his presence. It starts when he's doing this work inside of you, getting you prepared for what he wants to do. Big picture in you. Most people don't go through this point of prepared. They don't get to the next step because they're not ready to prepare. Who's ever cooked dinner or anything? Who's ever cooked anything? You know, if you're going to cook something, you've got to get prepared. You've got to bring the right stuff to be able to cook what you want to cook. So you thought you were just coming to church today and you're going to go through that. Here's what we're going to do. Today, you are going to be some of the first people to experience Tom's cooking show. I'm going, I, I, you're wondering what these are? I'm going to do some cooking for you today, and I, I need a person to help me. At my house, my wife is the cook. My wife is the cook, and she calls me her sous chef. That's like the assistant, which doesn't make any sense because her name is Sue. Her middle name is Sue. She should be the sous chef. I should be, but she, I'm her sous chef, so I just help her. But I need some, Michelle, come on up here. You'll be a great, okay, you're the sous chef. There you go. You need practice. You're going to have fun with this one. Okay, so you're going to help me right now. You're going to be my sous chef. I'm going to give you instructions on what to do. Today, we are going to bake cupcakes. Who likes some cupcakes? Okay, you like some cupcakes? We're going to bake some cupcakes. So what do you need in order to have good cu- cupcakes? You need to have the right ingredients. Okay, let me go. I, I, I went and I got some ingredients. Let me get all these out here. You're going to help me right here. Here you go. Instead of getting all the flour and all the other stuff, I just went to the store and bought a packet full of Here you go. Okay, those are all the right. Open that up. Put that in there. Ingredient number one, you got that. <laughs> Do I need a new sous chef? You got this. I'm going to fire you. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm going to go Nick Saban and fire you really quick. Okay, here's the other thing you need. You need need three eggs. So you can take those three eggs and crack those and put them in there. I'll help you so we can go faster. Then we need we need some 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 milk in here. We're going to take this. Here, you can throw the butter in there. We need a whole cup of milk. Here we go. There we go. We'll do that. Boom. There we go. And this is organic, by the way. Okay. So we got this. We're trying to be healthy right here. So we got that. You got, oh, there's the butter. Put the butter in there. Okay. We have right now, she's putting in the last of all the right ingredients. All the right ingredients are in these, this cupcake batter. We're ready for this. Here's the thing. How many know sometimes in our life, we can have the right ingredients in us? We can. We can have good stuff in us. You know, I, I was thinking before I ever was a follower of Christ, there was some good stuff in me. There were different times where I had compassion. I remember one time in high school, we had something really horrible happen in our school, and, and uh, there was a car accident, and two young men who were, who were in, our, in our school, they died in this car wreck. And I remember the next day when we came to school, the school was in shambles. Everybody was upset, and everybody was crying, and, and they actually had to cancel class. We didn't have counselors back then, but people just stood in class, or they sat there, and they cried. And, and I was looking around at all these hurt people, and I thought, hurt people need love. And then I went to the principal and I said, I have an idea. I said, why don't we have in our school, why don't we have a thing called hug day? That's a great idea. Why are you laughing? That was an amazing idea. I said, we need hug day. I said, if we see someone who's hurting or someone who's upset, we just go up and we give them a hug and we hug them and we show them love. And the principal said, I think that's a great idea, Tom. So in my school, we started having hug day. How many of you, when I said hug day, you just kind of cringed because you don't like hugs? How many of you don't like hugs? Raise your hand. If you don't like hugs, raise your hand. You don't like hugs. Raise your hand. You don't like hugs. Come here, my brother. (laughs) Hug day. You get double dose. There you go. (laughs) Sorry, I'm honoring. But no, we started hug day, and I mean, no, that was it was an act of compassion, and it was amazing how it was amazing how people just showed other people love. And I had that idea. I was like, man, that's awesome. Here's the problem. I had some of the good ingredients in me, and sometimes we have good ingredients. Let's start making this other one. We're gonna make another one right here. Sometimes we can have good ingredients in us. Here, put this one in. 
Put that in there right there. There's a good ingredient. That's a good ingredient. Here, here's another good ingredient. This is butter, but it's not melted like the other one. You know what? Let's just leave the wrapper in it. Um, <laughs> sometimes we can have good ingredients. Oh, wait, we need eggs in this one too. There we go, three eggs. That's good. Put another one in. That's good. Put another one in there. Okay. Sometimes we can have good ingredients, but they're not, they're not the right way. They're not prepared the right way. I was thinking about the good ingredients and the bad ingredients. See, I, I had something good in me, but it was amazing how, how that good got changed sometimes. Okay? Hold on a second. You ready? She's excited. You're the sous chef. You're the sous chef. Wait till the... Okay. There you go. <laughs> so, I appreciate your passion. That was good. Two weeks later, after, I, I, after we made Hug Day, two weeks later after Hug Day, I was sitting in, uh, I was sitting in our, our cafeteria. And we had different places where different people sat. And, and I sat at the, the athletes and the cheerleader table, which was really stupid that we had that. But I sat there, and then there was this girl who was new in our school. She sat at that table, and we walked up, and we saw her. And my friend's like, she's at our table. What are you going to do about it? And I was like, it's not hug day, so what do I do? And, and I went up, and I just started making fun of her. And I started saying horrible things to her. And then when I started it, the other people jumped in, and they started saying horrible things to her. And as I was there, she just started crying uncontrollably, and she jumped up, and she ran away from the table. And, and, uh, and I was like, yeah, and I gave them a high five. But on the inside, I was torn apart. How many know sometimes our good ingredients get messed up by the outside? See, because our good ingredients are only good. God wants us to have great ingredients, and that only happens in his presence. And sometimes, sometimes we can think, I'm going to do this, but we get messed up by culture, and we start putting bad ingredients on our life, like, like greed or envy. Anybody ever had that? We're gonna put some, let's put some greed and envy in there real quick. Here we go. What do I have that would be good greed and envy? Here, here we go, right here, right here. What are these? Anchovies. Who in here likes Anchovies. You need Jesus. Go ahead and put those in there. Anchovies. Let me see. I got another great one in here. So anchovies, and we have these. Don't, don't cut yourself because I don't want any. Oh, ooh. I thought you were going to eat one. I'll give you a taco if you eat one of those. Yeah, eat an anchovy. I'll give you a taco. I'll give you a free one. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Oh, okay. Brian, you can never kiss her again. <sighs> just, how's that taste? That tastes good. Oh. So we get bad stuff in our life, like, you know, and how you know now? <laughs> you were a drink. With, with social media, with social media, we're so moved by other people and what they think, and, and we, want, we want approval from everyone, and, and we can have all this junk in our life, and, and we look and we compare ourselves to everyone, and we can add some ingredients in our life. We add some ingredients in our life that are nasty sometimes. Who would agree with that? Anybody got anything? Who has some ingredients in your life that are nasty that come out when somebody cuts you off on the highway? Anybody got any of those? Oh, yeah. You tell them they're number one. One time, one time someone got mad at me on the highway and they flipped me off and I drove up beside them and it was someone from our church. <sighs> Bad ingredients. I got one more ingredient here. I got another ingredient here. Who thinks this is, a, who, who wants to, who would like some of this ingredient right here? This is a special one. You want some? No, I don't think you do. Right here, what we have right here in every service, who, who, who can guess what this is? Someone said chocolate. You think it's chocolate? Do you like chocolate? Would you like some? Okay, it's not chocolate. Okay, this is beef liver that has been mixed in a blender. I will buy you another taco if you take an anchovy and you dip it in the beef liver. <laughs> okay, here we go. You may do this one. Here we go. Right here. This is, oh, this, oh, oh, is it raw? No, no, it's, doesn't that look good? No. There we go. So, there we go. Don't forget that part. Okay, you get to mix those two up. <laughs> you get the blender, and you get to mix those two up. And we'll get here. I'll move this stuff out of the way. And we'll let you mix those two up. <laughs> Here's what I want to say. When we go through and we get the right ingredients in, after we, after we have preparation, you know what we have? We have process. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. What is the process? The process is where you go from, from having the stuff you're supposed to, getting your heart right, getting things lined up, 
to getting to the place you're supposed to be. The process is like this blending. <laughs> Who's ever felt like you've been going through the blender or the mixer in your life and you feel like, oh man, things are just getting the crud knocked out of me everywhere I go. That's part of what this process is. Well, so David went through this process. Let me, let me look at this. It, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, it says, And after Saul returned, David went into hiding from pursuing the Philistines. He, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. And so Saul took, he took 3,000 chosen men from Israel, and he set out to look for David and his men near the crag of the wild goats. Just have to say that with a little intensity. And it says, And he came to the sheep pens along the way, and a cave was there. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Does anybody else think that's funny? <laughs> I mean, I just think that's funny. This, Saul went to go to the bathroom. He had to go, whatever. Okay. And so he went in to relieve himself. Now, he was in the cave where David and his men were. That had to be gross for David and his men because they're sitting there watching the guy relieve himself. And David went, he, it says, he went in, and David and his men were waving in the back of the cave. And the men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of. When he said to you, I will give your enemies into your hands to deal, with you as you, to deal with you as you wish. And then David crept up unnoticed. Okay. Years before this, David was anointed to be the king of Israel. He had went through this whole thing. He had gotten prepared. He had been, you know, in the, in the wilderness, being what he was supposed to be. And then all of a sudden, now... King Saul, the person who had his job that God had given him, King Saul is right there, and David has a chance to take care of it. He has a chance to go and to kill Saul and to become the king. Here's what I want to say. Once we get the, the, the preparation ready, we go through the process. David could have skipped the important part of the process and done the wrong thing to get to where he wanted to go. How many times in the process do we, for, do we leave God out of that and we say, I'm going to do this myself? But what did he do? It says he cut off a piece, of his, a piece of his robe, a piece of his robe, and it says afterward David's conscience was stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He could have killed him. All he did was cut off a corner of his robe, but he still felt bad. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do any such thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him for, for his anointed. He is the anointed of the Lord. And with these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul and Saul left the cave and went his way. Here's what we have. Sometimes, sometimes we're in this and we go through the process of having everything mixed up. Sometimes we go through this whole process and halfway through we don't like how it feels uncomfortable. Anybody out there with me? And so we quit in the middle of the process. But God, God wants to see it through to the end. Here's what else I want to say. God doesn't just want to see it through to the end. God has an amazing, great plan beyond what you could dream if we keep a part of the process. Okay, who wants the right ingredients in your life? Who wants the beef liver? And who wants the anchovies? Okay, let's just be honest. Let's just be transparent. Who has the beef liver and the anchovies in your life right now? Anybody else? Those of you who don't, I'm going to check your mail. <laughs> But many times we have the beef liver and the anchovies a part of our life. But what if, what if we say, God, I'm going to get this out of my life. And God, I want, I want this in my life. And even though sometimes it's not comfortable and sometimes I don't feel like I want it, I'm going to keep going through the process. I'm going to keep going through this. Okay, part of the process. The Lord says, go tell someone about me. Okay, Lord, I'm going to share with someone about you. And we go share with someone about you, and they make fun of you, or they tell you to shut up, or, or they don't take your invite card. What do we do? Do we quit on the process, or do we keep going? I'm going to, let's go to the next part of what we're going to do. Go ahead and start putting that batter. Here's a cup. You can start putting that batter in those. Start pouring that batter in those. You're doing a great job. I'm going to give you a raise. She gets two tacos. <laughs> she gets two. Actually, you get four. You can take Brian's. You can take your husband's. You get four tacos. But we go through this process. I want to share this with you. The process. I remember when I, when I gave my life to Christ and God started dealing with my heart that he had something for me to do. I was like, okay, God, I'll do whatever you want. And I, and I felt like I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be a pastor. I went to Bible school, and I'm in Bible school going to be a pastor. And, and one day in Bible school, we're having chapel, and I'm in chapel, and I'm worshiping God. And God starts speaking to my heart. And God says, Tom, I want you to be a youth pastor. And I said, no, no. I don't want to be a youth pastor. I don't like teenagers. 
God, have you ever been around teenagers? God, do you know teenagers? Who in here knows teenagers? I don't want to be around them. I don't want to minister to them. I don't want to be close to them. I don't want to be near them. I said, choose somebody else. And God said, no, I want you to do it. Here was the process. God was asking me to do something I didn't want to do. I didn't feel comfortable doing. Will God ask you to do something you don't want to do or don't feel comfortable doing? Everybody look at me. Yes. Because he's got something bigger for you than you imagine or could think in your brain. And he has to get us out of our comfortable place. And so finally I said, yes, Lord, I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. And I remember I, I prayed and I said, God, I'll do it. But you got to drop in my heart and I got to love kids. And all of a sudden, I fell in love with teenagers. Loved them. Loved them. And one, wanted to be around them all the time. So we were a youth pastor for years. Go ahead. I'm going to have one of our ushers come up here. Give Michelle a big hand. She did a great job. Right. I need you to take those back to the annex. Take those back to the annex. Cook those really quickly in that super fast oven. And then bring back the, bring back the result real quick. But I, we went through the process. And I'm like, God, okay, I'll be a youth pastor. God put it in my heart. And I loved it. Loved it. We loved it. We loved it. Had kids over at our house all the time. It smelled bad, but we loved it. So we're going through being youth pastors. And one day after we had this amazing event where we had like 250 kids give their life to Christ, I'm driving home and I'm praying, God, thank you for what you did. And God spoke to my heart. And he goes, I, don't, I no longer want you to be a youth pastor. I want you to do something else. And I'm like, okay, Lord, what? He goes, I want you to pastor a church and start a church. And I said, no, God, I don't like old people. I said that to him. I don't want to be around old people. I love these teenagers so much. Why would you ask me to do that? Why? Because many times we think we know what the end of the process is, but God has a different, greater, better plan than we could ever imagine or dream. So what do we do? What do we do? We surrender in the process. When we feel like quitting, who's ever felt like quitting in the process? Right now, those, right now, right now the cupcakes are in the oven under extreme heat. Because they're going through a process of being changed to something greater. Anybody with me? See, sometimes when we go through that process, it changes us to the greatness that God has in us. But if we don't go through the process, if we skip it, we don't become who he wants us to be. And our life doesn't make the difference that he wants it to make. So what do we have here? We go through the preparation where we get everything in line. We get the things out of our life. We get the liver we get the anchovies out of our life. We get the things in our life he wants there. We go through the, the process. Philippians 1.6 says, There has never been a slightest doubt in my mind that the God who started this great work in you would keep at it and bring it to a flourishing finish. Bring it to what? A flourishing finish on the day when Jesus Christ arrives. What does that lead us to? It leads us to the prize. See, God will say, you're going to get the preparation, you're going to go through the process, then I'm going to give you the prize. Go ahead, guys, you guys got, got those, run them up here, run them up here real quick, run, run. There you go, okay, faster, here we go, I'll come and get those from you. Here's the process, those amazing, those amazing cupcakes that we made, we have those right here. We have some cupcakes right here, Michelle, you did a great job. Who would like, who would like one of these cupcakes? Who would like, I'm going to pass these out right now. You would like a cupcake? Who else would like a cupcake? I'm going to throw them to you. There you go. There's a cupcake. Who else would like a cupcake? I got to go over here this side. Wait, I'll go, I'll just walk all the way around. We'll just hand out cupcakes. There you go. There's a cupcake. There's a cupcake. Who else wants a cupcake? Anybody over here want a cupcake? Here, can you catch it? Here you go. I don't think you want me to toss it. I didn't say I was going to give you one. Sit down, man. Here, no, here's yours, really. Here's yours. Who wants one? You want a red velvet? There you go. You're going to have to, you, oh, you really want me to throw it? She's closer. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> I'm going to have to throw one. Is that okay? Anybody mind if I throw one? Anybody ready? I'm going to throw it. Catch it. There you go. Anybody over there? Want? I've got to do it. <laughs> right here. Back up a little bit. Catch it. I'm sorry, ma'am. If you get dirty, we'll give you an extra taco. Can church be fun? That's kind of a rule we have. Don't drop the taco. There you go. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> That was a bad throw, but a great catch. Did I give you one, Michelle? You get a taco. I have two left. Who wants a taco? Who will give me five dollars? Five dollars. Here you go. Cupcake. Sorry, I'm thinking tacos. Right over here, I got two left. There you go. You can have that one. Okay, I'm gonna give you one if you dance. You gotta dance. You gotta dance. Dance. Okay. Floss. 
<laughs> there you go. Okay, that's we'll give you we'll give you we'll give you one for the effort. Okay, sorry. <laughs> How you know the prize? If you look at David, what happens? Let's look at the story. 2 Samuel chapter 5, it says, When all the tribes of Israel went to David at Hebron, and they told him, We know, we are, we are your own flesh and blood. In the past, Saul was our king, but you were the one. Whatever, everybody saw the process. Everybody saw who the leader was. Everybody saw the greatness in David. But you were the one who really led the forces of Israel. And the Lord told you, you'll be the shepherd of my people Israel. You will be Israel's leader. So there at Hebron, King David made a covenant before the Lord and all the elders of Israel. And look at this. And they anointed him king of Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned for 40 years in all. See, God wants to, the prize, the prize is where God wants to take us. And the prize is where we want to go to immediately. But it doesn't happen unless you get prepared, get the things out, shouldn't be there. And you're willing to go through the process. And watch God do something amazing. Who wants your life to count? Who wants your life to make a difference? Who wants your life to impact and change other lives and have this? Lord, we pray for that right now. Let's pray. I pray for that right now, that we would live lives. God, we live in a culture. God, we live in a culture where our lives are all about us. Where our lives are all about our stuff and what we want. And we live in a culture where where it is so eye-focused, and that's not what you call us to be. Lord, your word actually says this. It says, to live is Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what our life's supposed to be about, for us to live is Christ. It's about you. And God, let us have our hearts and our lives be about you and be surrendered to you and be purposeful toward you. God, help us in the preparation and the process that we would not give up. And for those in this room that have given up because times were hard or they got discouraged, Lord, I thank you that your word says that your gifts and your callings, your plans don't go away. And I ask you to bring them back to life again today. Well, we're in prayer all across the room. I think most people in this room, we want our life to make a difference. And some of you felt empty because you've chased things that have never filled you. And today, I believe God would say, quit chasing the things that won't fill you and stop and surrender and let me fill you with what really matters. All across the room, when we're taking a second to look at our heart, if you are here today and you say, Tom, my heart, my life is not right with God. It's not right with God. Maybe it never has been. Maybe maybe you never said, Jesus, take control. I surrender it all to you. God has a plan bigger bigger for you than you could imagine. And all you have to do is surrender. Maybe you're hearing at one time you did, but you've kind of gotten distracted and life, life can get so busy and, and messed up. But today you're like, I'm going to surrender and say, God, I want my life to matter. Mm. Parents in this room, what if you had your life matter in front of your children? What if you set that example for them of what it's supposed to look like? It could change your whole family by us surrendering today. All across the room while we're in prayer. If you're here today and you say, Tom, my heart, my life isn't right with God. I'm not surrendered, not living for him, but I want my life to count. And today I want to surrender and have him do something big on the inside of me and fill me with purpose and with peace and with joy. I want to pray for you all around the room. You say, Tom, that's me. My heart, my life isn't right, but I want it to be. Pray. Our hands are already going up. Pray for me. If that's you right now, lift your hand up all around the room. Today I surrender. Lift him up high. Lift him up high. Oh, man, all across the room. Hands are going up. All are, thank you, Lord. Anybody else, keep raising them up. God's got a purpose and a plan for you, and it's bigger than you, and you want to surrender to it completely and totally and say, God, use my life to make a difference, and I do it by surrendering. I'm going to lead us in a prayer right now. Everybody in the room praying with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I surrender. I surrender my heart and my life and my everything to you. Take my life and use it for your good, for your kingdom for your purpose. Thank you for loving me so much that Jesus died for me. And let me love you so much that I live for you. Make my life count. In Jesus' name, amen. Things we need to change, let's get prepared. Things we need to get rid of, let's get rid of. Things we need to add, let's add. When we're going through the process, what do we do? We don't give up. Here's a cool thing. 
It's easy not to give up when you have other people who are helping you. That's why we have a church. That's why we have connection group because you can't go through this alone. It's too tough. But if you're willing to say, God, I, I need your help and I'm going to surround myself with people who will push me and help me forward, God will do something big and something amazing because our lives are called to count. Our lives are called to count in Jesus' name. Who wants that? Who's ready to eat some tacos? We're going to close in prayer. We're going to pray over the tacos. All the tacos are probably already blessed, but we're going to bless them again. Here's what you do as you leave. Our ushers will hand you a card. Each card, each card is worth two free tacos. You can go out there and get a couple of tacos. And, and we have waters that are free for everybody. If you want to buy a pop, you can. I think the ice cream truck is out there. You can go out there and get some ice cream. Go play on inflatables. <clears throat> and let's have a great time. Who's ready? Who's ready to eat some tacos? Lord, we thank you for a great day. I ask you to bless this food. I ask you to bless our time. And Lord, let us walk out of here making our lives count in Jesus' name, amen.